Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to the Outsourcing International Responsibility Panel. Uh, my name is MJ Durkee and I'm the Associate Dean and Allen Post Professor at the University of Georgia School of Law and I also direct the Dean Rusk International Law Center here, which is a proud sponsor of this event. And I'm delighted to speak with you today with a, a brilliant lineup of other uh, scholars here today. We have Kristen Boone, who's the Miriam T. Rooney Professor of Law at Seton Hall University. Uh, Shimon Keitner, the Alfred and Hannah Fromm Professor of International Law at UC Hastings. And Alex Mills, Professor of Public and Private International Law at the Faculty of Laws at the University College London. So um, welcome everyone and welcome everyone in the audience. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce the subject matter of our panel today um, before we uh, will go around in, in a series of questions to talk about this in a more roundtable um, like format. So um, please do think about how you might want to um, participate in the conversation and feel free to shoot uh, something in the Q&A or, or chat boxes at any point. Um, and we'll try to get to some audience questions in the last um, 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes of this session. Um, okay, so what is this panel about? Um, states are abstract entities, right? They can only act through individual people. And when we want to know whether a state has actually violated a particular international law norm, we have to know which individual people are acting on behalf of the state. And this is because states aren't responsible for everything that happens within their territory or all the acts of all of their nationals, um, but they're just responsible for some of these acts. So we need to know, uh, is a military contractor who commits atrocities a state actor or is it a private actor? Is a postal service operator that violates an investor's rights and are a treaty doing that as part of the state or not? Um, when should we hold the state accountable for transboundary pollution, cyber warfare, and so on and so on? Um, so in other words, to hold states accountable for these violations of international law, we need a doctrine or a theory of attribution that answers the question, who speaks for and acts for the state? And thankfully, uh, the International Law Commission in 2001 gave us just this. It um, tried to answer this question for us. After a four decade effort, it offered a document that was intended to codify and progressively develop the customary international law rules of, on attribution. It offered um, the articles on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts, which have attribution rules. And these articles have three uh, different tests to answer this question about who or what acts for the state and what and who or what should be held accountable for breaches of international law. Um, and, and the first of these tests is that um, an organ of the state can be held responsible. Um, this is someone that, um, or this is an organ of the state as defined by domestic law. Um, also under Article 5, entities empowered to exercise elements of the governmental authority can be held accountable as a state. And third, someone acting under the direction or control of the state in Article 8 can be um, speaking on behalf of or acting for the state. So the rules seem rather straightforward on their face. An actor is the state if domestic law says it is, if domestic law doesn't say it is, but the actor seems to be exercising some sort of governmental authority, or the state is directing and ordering the activity, and so it's fair to treat the actor as an agent of the state. Um, uh, so that's just about all I want to say, because there's a lot to talk about here, but I want to point out that these rules on, in the ILC's conception of them are secondary rules, meaning that they should apply across different substantive areas of international law, um, and those rules of international law provide the primary rules. So this is a trans-substantive area of law, supposedly. But as our panelists will tell you, and many of you in the audience probably already know, it's not quite as simple as it seems. The rules embed all sorts of questions. And one of the particularly thorny areas that we're going to focus on today is trying to find a dividing line between public and private entities and deciding which to attribute to the state. Um, and this is our focus today. Like when exactly is a company um, acting with governmental authority when the state outsources to private actors functions like policing, military functions, intelligence, espionage, and so forth. Can the state avoid responsibility by outsourcing, right? How do you determine what falls within the governmental authority? Or what about state-owned companies? Um, are they agents of the state under Article 8 
if a state owns shares in a company or even wholly owns a company, but the company is a separate legal person with its own corporate charter and personality, is the company uh, an organ of the state? Is it uh, acting under the control of the state? Um, and so the bottom line is we're trying to figure out when is an act performed by a corporation properly attributed to the state? Do the rules adequately deal with state involvement in activity or abuses? that happen by transnational corporations? And how does this all look now, 20 years after the ILC's articles? Um, of course, this can have real world implications for all sorts of areas of law, international environmental law, human rights law, laws of war, humanitarian law, investment law, and so forth. So what do we think? Round one, um, let's get started with a bit of a lightning round um, of questions here, a scene setting question. Um, so a question for the panelists, are there developments in the law or in the world in the past 20 years that affect how we assess these rules? What has or hasn't changed about the facts that the tests navigate or the primary rules of international law that might be relevant? So um, uh, Kristen, Professor Boone, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to echo uh, what MJ said, just with regards to the, you know, the, the great influence that the rules have had um, since they were promulgated by the International Law Commission 20 years ago. Um, there was a wonderful symposium in Egil Talk, actually, just in August, uh, where various scholars gave their points of view on this. And so that's definitely worth um, looking at. And one other thing I just wanted to flag as an introductory matter is that the UN, uh, the codification division puts out a document every couple of years in which they show where different courts and tribunals have cited the rules. And the most recent um, report is from 2019 and it's UN doc A slash 70 floor slash 83. And that shows you the breadth and scope of the areas in which the rules have been applied. And so I think really um, speaks to the, the points that MJ made in the intro. But what we've been asked to talk about right now is, you know, really where to next? Where are the articles showing their age? And I just wanted to highlight a few things that I think um, are showing you know, where the rules are starting to um, seem a little bit outdated. So the first one is that I think that they are under-inclusive. They only apply to states and under the three tests that, that MJ just mentioned, um, organs, uh, you know, entities or agents affiliated with states, but they don't apply to um, uh, they don't apply to other areas, right? They don't apply to natural persons. Um, in fact, we have a different regime of law, international criminal law that deals with that. They don't apply to international organizations. We have a different proposal um, that, that the ILC has put forward um, on that. And so I think today, as a result, there's really a perception that they are under-inclusive given the number of international actors on the international scene, particularly corporations and rebel groups who really may have um, no affiliation or a very thin affiliation with the state. Um, I think that there's also been a rapid hollowing out of the state and the ILC's rules uh, uh, are based on practice that predate 2000. They don't reflect the rapid growth of the field of human rights. They don't reflect the internet. Uh, they don't reflect the prominence of non-state actors in areas like cyber war warfare um, or the rise in what I would call state affiliated entities um, like sovereign wealth funds or pension funds, um, which are today really massive players on the international um, scene. Uh, and so they have quite a limited view in a way. Um, and I think that that's really the area that um, that um, shows their age. Thank you. Um, so I think that uh, to echo Kristen, the question is framed in terms of these, you know, 20 year old articles, but of course, they took decades to write and um, parts of the attribution rules that I focused on uh, I have a 2016 article, for example, in the Duke Journal of International and Comparative Law looks at the attribution of ultra vires acts by state officials to the state. And uh, as many may know, those rules are really rooted in uh, claims commission jurisprudence from uh, 100 years ago. And uh, they, they filled a perceived need at that point. Uh, but as Kristen says, I think a, a reevaluation in light of contemporary developments uh, would be warranted. Uh, when Kristen says under inclusive, I understand by that to mean not necessarily that we should put other entities into this set of rules, but rather that what has happened 
is a, a misperception that the only kind of international responsibility that matters is state responsibility uh, or an overemphasis on the state as the only actor that uh, should bear or can bear legal consequences for its actions under international law as opposed to domestic law. And uh, as Kristen mentioned, there are so many other contexts now in which these draft articles have been referenced. The real danger, I think, is that uh, they tend to take up all the oxygen in the room. Uh, it's clear, MJ, as you said at the beginning of the panel, that states are legal fictions that can only act through uh, natural persons, uh, just as are corporations, for example. Uh, and I think that we have made a lot of progress in recent years on uh, theorizing with the, you know, taking the lead from Andre Nolkamper and others, this idea of shared responsibility. So we're past the point, I think, where uh, the, the articles took up all the oxygen in the room to the point of uh, denying that other types of entities and actors and, and notably natural persons can bear responsibility under international law, although as Kristen mentions, uh, that remains under theorized. Uh, but I think the now that we're at a point of recognizing shared responsibility, we're still struggling with how the international system can best adjust the mechanisms that we have for determining whether or not uh, an actor has indeed violated those primary rules and attaching consequences to those violations. And to the extent that this uh, sort of lingering shadow of uh, the sole responsibility of the state to the exclusion of other types of actors remains, uh, I think that's been a real obstacle. Uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah, um, so um, all um, extremely interesting and important points. And I think um, um, definitely some of the challenge to the articles done, does come from the kind of broader realm of questions of responsibility, but involving different actors and different kinds of responsibility in different contexts. Um, I, I guess just to kind of focus in a little bit on the articles themselves, there are also challenges that have come up in the articles themselves, just in the, in their sort of sphere of application. Um, and um, to, to me, one of the biggest problems here with the articles has always been um, how do you design international law rules that work well universally to determine the limit of the state, given the variety of different states there are out there. Um, and there's a sort of basic tension here between two impulses that we might have. One impulse is that we should defer to the rights of states to organize their internal affairs the way that they want. And so we should defer to domestic law to find answers to these kinds of questions. And the other is that we should avoid states being able to rely on kind of domestic characterizations to evade international responsibility or structure their affairs to kind of minimize their international responsibility. And that suggests the need for kind of objective international standards. Um, and I think one of the big tensions that the rules have faced is a kind of big change in the nature of um, states themselves and the organization of states. So when the ILC began its work in this field, you know, the, the problem wasn't, um, the, the biggest challenge was dealing with states that carried out commercial activity through, um, you know, very extensively through state owned and controlled um, entities. Um, and so the issue was, was sort of about how to exclude the operation of entities and acts which don't really belong to the realm of public international law, but are really about private commercial activity. Um, it was an issue that arose in both state responsibility and state immunity um, in different contexts. Um, but obviously we've seen dramatic changes since then, uh, particularly from the 1980s onwards, um, as you know, states have essentially shrunk and shifted power to the private sector. Um, and so the kind of problems that the ILC is confronting have um, changed in quite a dramatic way. The, the problem is now not the big state, but the small state. Um, so when should states who have privatized or marketized what were previously governmental functions be held responsible for the acts of those functions? Um, now, the, the people working on these issues at the ILC were very aware of these developments and the rules were drafted with them in mind and, and states were also you know, aware of these developments in commenting on the draft articles. So uh, it'd be wrong to suggest that the problem of privatization you know, is a new problem or that it emerged after the articles were adopted or that those drafting the articles weren't aware of it, but it was intensifying during the period when the articles were being crystallized and, and that's very much continued since. And so I think that's also a kind of challenge that the articles have faced. 
uh, we've already started um, jumping into more of a substantive assessment of the rules. So let's go there next. Um, let's think about whether the attribution rules are effective or ineffective at helping international law function well. Do they have unexpected consequences? Have they cast a helpful or unhelpful shadow into various areas of law or practice? What do we think of them? Um, and here, let's let's um, let's go right back to you, Mills. Why don't you start this one, uh, Alex? Sure. Um, so, if we're talking about privatization, I guess um, one of the contexts where this has had a, a, a particular influence, and I guess it's the context that I'd like to focus on, um, is in the field of international investment law. Um, and this is because a very significant part of privatization has happened through. Uh, cross-border capital flows. So privatization has created a lot of new foreign investors uh, who have from time to time found themselves unhappy with their treatment by their host state and in need of very expensive legal advice. So more specifically for our purposes, international investment laws also generated a large amount of practice where questions of attribution have, have come up in relation to the treatment of foreign investors by privatized or parastatal entities. So entities which aren't formally parts of the state, but which might be exercising some kind of public authority, either in managing the process of privatization, there's disputes around that process itself, or in regulating uh, the privatized industry. Um, so privatization has both created foreign investors um, and led to difficult problems in determining state responsibility for acts against foreign investors. And this has really put the articles to a test in a practical way and with an intensity that I think wasn't anticipated 20 years ago. Um, so how have the articles fared? Well, the first thing to say, and I think this echoes some things that uh, have been said before, is that it's impossible to imagine a dispute arising about attribution and state responsibility, which didn't involve citation and discussion of the articles in their commentary, right? They just, they just have a centrality in this field, which is undeniable. And, that's a remarkable achievement in itself for a piece of what is still basically soft law. I mean, despite the kind of enduring question about whether this should become a treaty, um, it's a soft law codification of practice. Um, and uh, you know, even if the articles have occasionally uh, struggled to shake off the uh, adjective draft, um, they've still uh, you know, had uh, an incredible sort of influence here. Um, not just the articles, but also the commentary, which is a kind of even softer commentary on the soft law. Um, and it's, it's quite a tribute to, you know, to, to the work of those who prepared the articles and, and say particularly uh, the uh, late lamented Professor James Crawford. Um, so the articles obviously have played a fundamental role in kind of policing the boundary between conduct for which a state bears responsibility and conduct for which it doesn't. Um, but this is not to say that the articles have always been applied, and certainly not that they've always been applied well. Um, they've just become impossible to ignore. So the second thing that I would say, and this is a little bit more awkward, is that both sides of a dispute will almost always find some aspect of the articles or their commentary to cite in, in support of their position. Um, so the centrality of the articles and commentary in policing the boundary of state responsibility doesn't necessarily reflect a claim that they actually provide a clear boundary. It's, it's more about the fact that they have provided the concept, conceptual framework through which we now think about these boundary problems. Um, in particular, they do suggest some kind of role for domestic law, uh, deferring to each state in the way that it you know, organizes in its internal affairs, but also a role for international law in kind of providing some kind of objective framework uh, also for the way we think about that. So for example, in terms of international law, um, they, they uh, provide a role for some kind of objective determination of what is a governmental function, but they don't actually set out a definition of what is a gov governmental function beyond kind of a deference to that provided by national law, but they do preserve a space for that kind of definition to be made and um, to be sort of made. Um, so a couple of impacts of this, I think one around the possibilities of attribution and one around the limits of attribution. In terms of the possibilities, I think um, there are more arguments, of course, around when states ought to be held responsible for the co conduct of private parties, when responsibility ought to be extended in certain ways. Um, so there's, there's arguments that kind of push the extensive extension of responsibility. Um, 
And you know, the lack of clear boundaries, I think, encourages or opens up possibilities for litigation of these questions. And it's part of what's fueled international investment law, you know, the, the development of international investment law as a discipline. Um, and of course, it's true that art, the articles leave some space for states to arrange their affairs with kind of minimization of responsibility in mind. Uh, and so we do see, you know, practices that we've already talked about, you know, non-state groups in armed conflict, cyber, cyber espionage, you know, election manipulation. Um, but there are also le less dramatic examples, uh, states distancing themselves from the treatment of foreign investors by setting up parastatal entities who are acting as a sort of public regulator in certain fields. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the sort of lack of, I guess, precision in the rules opens up a lot of space for kind of contestation here. Now, in terms of the limits attribution, of attribution, I think the, the challenges, the difficulty in, in attributing the conduct of private actors to the state has also led um, for me to, I think, a, a kind of opposing trend, which is an increasing focus on the development of negative state obligations, uh, obligations to prevent certain outcomes, which operate as indirect means of establishing state responsibility. Um, so establishing responsibility for breach of an obligation to prevent is not about attributing positive acts to the state, but about responsibility arising from the failure to present to prevent the acts of private parties from taking place, or the failure to take you know, measures in response to those acts. So claims by investors sort of harmed by parastatal in entities are likely to be framed not only through uh, attribution claims, but also through, through claims addressing the state's failure to protect them from harm, to provide them um, with a safe and secure kind of operating environment with uh, full protection and security of whatever the relevant sort of treaty standard is. Um, and so I think there's a kind of interesting tension here um, with the um, the, the role of the articles in both kind of facilitating um, these questions, um, but also that complexity in, in some ways prompting sort of developments outside the articles as well. Um, yeah, that's probably what I wanted to say. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, let's see, back to you, Shimon. Uh, thanks, MJ, and, and I think two things to echo in Alex's remarks. Uh, one is uh, absolutely a, a great opportunity to commemorate James Crawford uh, and to, to uh, just articulate that all of this uh, friendly critique is very much in the spirit of continuing the endeavor uh, that he labored on. Uh, and then also uh, really appreciated the, the mention of um, how cyber fits into all of this and, and thinking uh, both of the contexts that you mentioned, uh, both espionage and election interference, but then also ransomware, which of course uh, is is top of mind and very much uh, being discussed lately in uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, with respect to, you know, I even heard a suggestion yesterday that uh, the unwilling and unable test should now apply to Russia with respect to control of. Uh, ransomware operations emanating from its territory. So maybe that's something from for Q&A. Uh, but in, in this segment, I think what I'd uh, like to emphasize is, is related, um, but the, the effect of articulating these articles of state immunity as legal doctrine, as Alex says, which is very much um, how they tend to be used in practice, notwithstanding maybe their technical status uh, as, as soft law, um, really has resonated in an area that I've looked at closely, which is litigation in domestic courts. Uh, and for purposes of this conversation, maybe we can focus on US courts. Uh, so for those of you who are um, getting CLE credit for this panel, or even if you're not, uh, some of the materials attached include a brief that um, Bill Dodge, Sarah Cleveland, and I submitted in uh, a pending Ninth Circuit case it's an appeal of a denial of immunity to the NSO group uh, in litigation uh, here in California brought by WhatsApp, owned by Facebook, of course, um, alleging that NSO has violated US law uh, by essentially using WhatsApp as a, as a vehicle to install its malware um, in, in shorthand. And NSO group uh, made an immunity claim, that is a, a claim of immunity from uh, US domestic jurisdiction on the basis, um, not that it was entitled to immunity by virtue of uh, being an Israeli company, of course it's privately owned, 
uh, subject to a number of Israeli export controls, but nonetheless uh, indisputably a private company, but rather arguing that because it claims to only have nation states as clients, uh, any activities it might have conducted, whether or not they violated U.S. law, um, were done at the behest of uh, their, their paying clients, uh, foreign states, uh, thereby transforming them into uh, de facto uh, agencies or instrumentalities or organs or, or agents of the state uh, for purposes of either uh, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which, uh, as most of you know, is the statute that governs state immunity uh, from jurisdiction in U.S. courts, uh, or alternatively, uh, and where the action really is in this argument, is under uh, the common law. Because uh, unlike some other countries' state immunity acts, the U.S. FSIA really does um, apply by its text only to states, uh, state-owned entities and agencies and instrumentalities. And so uh, the NSO group, although clearly not a natural person, uh, which is one category of uh, state actors that the US Supreme Court determined in a case called Samantar, uh, are not covered by the FSIA. Uh, NSO group says, well, you know, we too uh, are entitled to common law immunity outside the FSIA regime by virtue of the fact that we are acting on behalf of states, uh, unidentified states in the plural, and, uh, and that this uh, derivative immunity, uh, which uh, is, is a slightly different concept, but one that they also invoke, uh, should shield them from having to defend their actions in a US court. Um, so again, that argument was unsuccessful at the trial level. Uh, the, there's been an appeal. WhatsApp says that, that the immunity determination should not be uh, subject to interlocutory appeal. I think that we've seen in a number of cases that that argument is not likely to succeed. Um, but I think the, the more uh, important point, which is whether or not immunity is available to NSO group, uh, is, is one that uh, I and my co-authors uh, argue very strongly against. And so we'll have to see where the Ninth Circuit comes out on that, but I think uh, it really highlights, um, you know, what Alex was saying is if we have a, a shrinking state, then uh, the outsourcing of functions, in this case, espionage, uh, would um, create additional issues in terms not only of what's attributable to the state for international law purposes, um, but then also conversely, the extent to which the private entities uh, that are being uh, empowered in different ways. And I think the way in which they are empowered is relevant, but here, you know, through uh, essentially a, a, a commercial uh, transaction, the way in which they can then cloak themselves in the immunity of the state or not when it comes to uh, domestic litigation. Uh, and so I might also just mention uh, a really excellent conversation on the EGIL Talk podcast uh, under the, the title is No License to Kill. Um, but the conversation really delves into uh, some of these questions of, of attribution and immunity. It's among uh, Dapo Akande, Filippo Webb, and Marco Milanovic. Uh, and I think you know, one of the points that they make uh, in the course of their conversation uh, is that uh, at least UK practice, uh, and I think US practice as well, generally requires uh, the invocation of immunity by the state itself. So not just by uh, a particular defendant who says, you know, I'm immune because I was acting on behalf of the state. And, you know, we don't have that in the NSO case. And it's an interesting question whether um, if part of the reason for outsourcing some of these, and again, I'm not going to call it a public function necessarily, and we can maybe come back to that in our, our third round, um, but some of these acts that states desire for whatever combination of reasons to perform, uh, outside of sourcing them to private entities, uh, could be just a lack of, of in-house expertise when it comes to things like hacking, um, but also perhaps some desire to, to distance the state itself um, from the acts uh, to, to disavow uh, responsibility, uh, then if the state does not essentially you know own up to the acts by invoking immunity it would be um, highly ironic if the the outsourcing also then had the function of um, insulating private entities from legal proceedings to which they would otherwise be subject thanks Jermaine.
Uh, Kristen, over to you. Thank you very much. So I, um, I wanted to go back to the three different tests for attribution in the articles. We have the um, institutional link test um, organs or entities of the state. And I think that that one's quite settled um, and there's not much to say about that. But I think that there um, are interesting things to say about articles five and article eight, um, the functional links um, test and also the control test. Uh, and I want to start with the control test because there's been a really interesting decision that just uh, was rendered by the European Court of Human Rights in September about the poisoning of the former Russian agent um, by Russia. And I think th this comes up in the, excuse me, in the podcast that um, that Shimen mentions um, on Egil talk. But you know what um, was um, what the court there found was that. Um, you know, Russian agents poisoning uh, this former agent in um, London, uh, just on the basis of uh, of the articles on state responsibility, was a clear way in which they were controlling this activity. Um, and so the attribution test was applied um, in an interesting way, and they said that Russia is responsible, even though it was extraterritorial. You know, so I think that gives us a very you know an interesting case and a good set of facts for um, this upholding of Article Eight uh, in in quite a doctrinal way. Um, there were other interesting issues that come up in the decision about um, immunity and also about um, who bears the burden of um, proving, uh, you know, the case in that circumstance. And there, you know, one of the things the European court said was that, you know, Russia seems to not really have taken this seriously or conducted an effective investigation, but that's on Russia, you know, so that's something to notice just in terms of burden shifting. But I think that's a great recent invocation of Article 8. With regards to Article 5, um, I wholly concur with the points that Alex made about the fact that, you know, of uh, parastatal entities, what is a parastatal entity? How do arbitral tribunals determine this is a really live issue? And there's some unclarity in the cases about that. Um, there, it's, I think I would say it's in a liminal state right now. We're seeing the development of special rules in certain treaties. Um, I think a good example of that is um, the new comprehensive investment agreement between China in the EU, where uh, the, the parties to that treaty, which is still in draft form right now, have moved away from um, the very general rules in the Articles of State Responsibility to very specific rules with regards to what constitutes a state-owned entity. In particular, these new treaties say things like, you know, the enterprise um, of the party um, would directly or indirectly own more than 50% of the share capital or control through ownership interest, the exercise of more than 50% of the voting rights, right? So you see now in, in industry specific treaties, um, numbers and, um, you know, specific thresholds, which will actually trigger a finding of uh, attribution in these circumstances. So, you know, I think the there is a lot to say about state-owned entities. And in the in the umbrella, I would say, you know, we've got state-owned entities, we've got state-affiliated entities. We've even, if we look at it from a historical perspective, have things like charter companies, you know, the Hudson's Bay Company or the Dutch East India Company. And so the, you know, the relationships of states and enterprises is goes back a long way, but we're in a situation now where there's both been an outsourcing of activities and I think at the same time a consolidation uh, at, a, at a high level of the international economy and in certain um, investment vehicles or, or companies. Uh, and there's lots of rules if we take a step back or lots of reasons I should say about why we tend to regulate monopolies or why we might wanna have rules about state-owned enterprises in law. You know, there's typically low levels of transparency. Um, they are protected from competition. They might be more susceptible to being bailed out um, if they fail. And so, you know, antitrust law, um, bankruptcy law, you know, gives us lots of ideas about how we might think about, um, you know, what the thresholds should be in terms of, of attribution. And so from my perspective, you know, I think legal culture is relevant. Uh, you know, certain areas of the world just have, as a matter of legal tradition, had a lot of, uh, you know, more state involvement in, um, in corporations. But in addition to that, you know, we need to think about um, what at the 10,000 foot level we want to say about, you know, what's the relationship between an enterprise and the state. And, you know, I think this is not just an issue of attribution, it's immunities, as Shimen has said, and then I would also posit it's bankruptcy, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, corporate law, right? It's, there's all these different fields of law that actually come into play when we say what's a state or what's, what's not a state. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Kristen. And I love how you left that um, with this 10,000 foot level. And, and Alex um, also mentioned this, that, um, looking at this from a conceptual framework, because I, I wanna step back and think about uh, what the rules are suggesting to us about our conception of a state and our conception of the, uh, the public and private sector. Um, and and I, I wanna make sort of three interrelated points. And first is that these attribution rules, although they're really purportedly agnostic and neutral about a state's internal uh, organization, actually have a very distinct view of the nature of statehood. Um, and this, this view facilitates what's called, what has been called here today, the, the shrinking state. Um, and this view of statehood and, and um, in turn the articles themselves, um, will actually become increasingly irrelevant in an, an environmentally and economically independent world, regardless of how much these rules are cited um, in courts um, and discussed. Um, and then lastly, that the articles police the public and private divide in a way that grows a governance gap because of our inability and our unwillingness to um, create an adequate framework for governance on the private side. So first point, the attribution doctrines um, express a distinct view of the nature of statehood. Of course, they, they say that they don't. They disclaim this. Article 4 explicitly leaves to a state's own domestic law um, whether something's an organ of the state. Article 5, uh, which attributes to the state the conduct of an actor exercising an element of the governmental authority, um, refuses to define what falls within that governmental authority, and that leaves this area of law really murky and subject to debate, especially in this privatization context. Um, so it seems like the articles are hand off, hands off, but they do in fact uh, erect a distinct image of the state. And I would uh, argue that this is a retrograde one. Um, and rather than a responsible state, I think they encourage a very minimally responsible state. So, um, of course, the state's not responsible for everyone or everything within its jurisdiction, but just some of them. Um, it's responsible uh, if the actor is, is a de jure a state actor under Article 4, de facto a state actor under Article 5, or under direct orders an agent under Article 6, or under Article 8, sorry. Um, so, so what kind of state does this construct? So bear with me for a second, because I want to take us back on a journey to the classic uh, in, environmental arbitration in the 1940s, the trail smelter arbitration, which articulated the principle that states have to prevent transboundary harms. And the tribunal there said, no state has the right to use or permit the use of its territory to cause injury in the territory of another. So in this classic case, we had a Canadian smelter. This is a, a, a kind of um, process where you're applying high heat to extract metals from their ores. So a Canadian smelter and the pollution was traveling across boundaries. Um, and, and ruining the apple orchards in Washington state. Um, and uh, so the transboundary harm rule is a principle of international environmental law that applies to states. So you need to know who is a state in this context. And in the trail smelter arbitration, the acts of the Canadian smelter counted as Canadian state action um, because Canada had directly taken responsibility for them in a treaty governing damages for this, these exact facts, this exact pollution. But imagine if these facts occurred with no treaty in place. Is the smelter an organ of the state? No. Is the smelter performing an element of the governmental authority? No, there's no particular reason to think smelting is governmental. Is the smelter doing its smelting under direct orders of the government? Well, no, most likely not. So um, we have no way to get at the activity of the smelter under the transboundary harm principle. Um, the state isn't responsible, not because it's not illegal, but because it isn't a state act. If we wanna nevertheless find a way to make Canada responsible, the articles would have us look to primary conduct rules. And it turns out there is a relevant primary conduct rule that's developing and developed here. And it's this due diligence principle that requires a state to take all appropriate precautionary measures to try to prevent transboundary harm, requires a state to regulate, to monitor, to take best efforts to prevent actors within its jurisdiction and territory from committing that transboundary harm. And this is appearing in all sorts of areas, um, not just in international environmental law, but certainly there, including the Paris Agreement, this um, legendary or landmark uh, Urgenda case, um, the Dutch Supreme Court in late 2019. Uh, so states, according to this principle, have to take all appropriate measures uh, for the prevention of climate change in that context. 
Um, but what I want to point out here is what you see about the attribution rules when you juxtapose them against this due diligence principle. So what the attribution rules of the articles are doing is constructing an irresponsible state, right? Or a state that's only minimally responsible. And, um, and this is a state with negative duties, not positive ones. It's a state that must refrain, uh, not a state that must exert itself. Um, it's a state in a horizontal contractual relationship with other states that has to answer to them for contractual breaches. And this is really the state that you think of when we talk about the post-Westphalian order, right? It's a sovereign with sovereign rights and prerogatives, including the right to make its uh, own international commitments and otherwise to be left alone, right? To be perhaps a bit irresponsible. Um, it's not the state that we see if we think about the responsibility to protect in, in, in international humanitarian law. It's not the state that we see in the modern human rights apparatus. It's not the state that we see in this emerging due diligence principle in climate law. And those conceptions cast the state as one with positive obligations. And these positive obligations are derived from a state's status as a sovereign, perhaps its status as an instrument of self-governance, an instrument of individual and collective self-determination. Um, and so these positive conceptions are conceptions that the state, or are duties that the state have um, so that it has a right to exist, right? A state that has a right to exist bears positive duties. And this clashes with the vision of the state in the articles, um, which uh, brings me to the point that the view of statehood um, that emerges from these attribution rules uh, will be increasingly uh, irrelevant in environmentally and economically independent, interdependent contexts. Um, and of course, the rules purport to be trans-substantive, but I don't think it's a surprise that over time, they've come to be more useful in some areas than others. Um, they've been developed mostly in the context of investment law, which is an area where private actors have to determine whether they have rights in court against an actor that may or may not be the agent of a state. Um, and so this is every bit a area where we need that um, contractual horizontal view of the state. But they've done almost no work at all in international environmental law in the two decades since the ILC completed its work. And primary rules like the due diligence principle are taking up the slack to grow the state's responsibility to take better care of things that are happening um, within a, the state's borders or uh, jurisdiction. And there's no reason that it has to be that way. That's what I'm the point that I'd like to, to make. There's no reason that this work has to be done um, through these primary rules rather than a system of state responsibility. And I and I'd like to keep the conversation moving, so I'll leave it right there, but perhaps I'll come around um, to say a little bit more about that in the next round. And so let me launch that round. Let's think about um, the next 20 years um, and where you might propose we go from here. So in the terms of the conference um, that we're part of today, should we reinvest in the ILC's articles or focus energy elsewhere? Uh, what's a key reform proposal or suggestion you might have? And this can be hypothetical or, or feasible, um, anything goes. So uh, Shimon, let's start with you. Uh, well, I, I hope this um, is in the realm of the feasible, but <laughs> I guess this remains to be seen. Uh, so MJ, thanks you know, very much for, for raising uh, trail smelter uh, and the due diligence obligation. It, it's great to get that in the mix. Uh, I have to commend a, a blog post by Rebecca Bratzbees in uh, Just Security, I think it was last year, uh, that goes through that case. And I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that Canada had uh, essentially stipulated that it would take responsibility for the actions in the context of that case. Um, we, we can get into that in Q&A as well. Um, and, and I chuckled just because it was the unexpected focus of a, a fair number of exchanges that I had with uh, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee when they were um, having a hearing on a bill about uh, China's immunity from lawsuits for COVID-19. Uh, but I, I wanted to actually in this round um, step away from from litigation or actual examples of litigation and say that I, I think that the contributions, um, including in, uh, for example, the edited volume that, that you're in the process of preparing MJ, which I hope you'll you'll plug in the Q&A, uh, is, is to really do exactly what, what we're trying to do here, which is step back and theorize the relationship between uh, the state as we, we now experience it uh, and these various actors, because uh, I think that the term that you used of governance gap building on Alex's 
remarks uh, is, is a very apt one. And so uh, while the ILC itself, uh, for example, in this area is developing um, you know, draft articles on the immunity of foreign officials from criminal prosecution, uh, that's a very sort of narrow context in which to be tackling this. And uh, it's a fairly narrow project, although it's gone on for years under several different special rapporteurs. Uh, so, so narrow does not mean uh, easy or straightforward by, by any means, um, but uh, trying to identify state practice on, on immunities. And I think, you know, that, that while that's a noble effort, um, maybe more fundamentally, we need to rather rather than taking as given these constructs as they've been articulated, whether it's in the draft articles of state responsibility or in various countries, domestic case law under their respective state immunity acts, or even under their uh, assessment of the current state of customary international law, is is precisely to recognize that um, that we're dealing, you know, with with a continuum rather than these discrete categories. Whether we talk about um, private or public acts, uh, whether we use the language used in the in the immunities conduct uh, context of uh, an official capacity act. And, you know, that's not just a limitation in this area, right? Clearly, when we're, we're developing legal doctrine, uh, we need to draw a line somewhere. And uh, every, every law student in the audience, I'm sure, has, has heard this spiel from one professor or another in one course or another. So this is not a, a particularly novel or, or insightful point. Um, but I do think it's relevant in this context that by um, by having doctrine that has evolved to force us to put acts in the private or public bucket, uh, even if at a certain period in history more acts went in the public bucket and perhaps now more acts are going in the private bucket, uh, we might want to just re-examine these buckets and whether or not they are uh, appropriate or fit for purpose. Uh, and uh, I think it was Alexander Orkashvili who years ago suggested with respect to individual responsibility and immunities that we should have some third category of acts. Uh, so not just jure imperii or jure gestionis, uh, but you know, some other category to capture, um, in his case, talking about uh, you know, international crimes essentially or conduct that would uh, currently fit into the jure imperii box, uh, according to many at least but that uh, in his view and the view of many others uh, doesn't, uh, shouldn't benefit necessarily from, from immunity in, in a number of instances. Uh, it's a similar sort of idea, you know, again, even adding a third box doesn't really uh, capture a, the continuum idea, but understanding that translating a continuum to doctrine may require creating categories uh, my, my proposal or suggestion would be that, that we uh, take a step back, uh, try to do, again, what folks on this panel have been doing in various fora, which is conceptualize these relationships and theorize them in a way that may enable us to produce categories in doctrine uh, that, that are better fit for purpose. Brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, Kristen. Thank you. So I would say that, you know, I mean, I don't think this is gonna happen in our lifetimes, but I would say that the, ultimate endpoint might very well be a unified regime of responsibility that covers not just states and international organizations, but multinational corporations, uh, other non-state actors, including individuals and rebel groups, right? That, that in a way, from an accountability perspective, would be what the best outcome would be with the treaty that backs it up uh, with, wide, um, with wide ratification and adherence. Um, I think we're moving slowly in that direction. And of course, there's certainly been uh, groups of uh, states at the UN who have um, attempted on a biannual basis to push for a, a treaty uh, itself for the Articles of State Responsibility. But we're in a, in a place right now where I think there is a lot of movement in different areas uh, and um, attempts to kind of work around the rules. And so I mentioned the, the, um, the CAI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, which I think proposes specific rules in the investor state context. And there's a few other treaties like that 
as well that are um, coming up with alternatives to the, the um, imprecision or the vague um, aspects of Article 5 because um, you know, arbitrators and, and parties themselves are finding that the rules are not specific enough to be predictable. And I think in this particular industry, and here I'm responding in part to the, the great question um, that Vlad put in the, in the Q&A chat here, I think in the investor state context, actually having more specific rules makes a lot of sense because there is so much variation in countries as to governmental involvement um, in enterprises. I mean, just for example, um, what I see in the literature, I'm not a China specialist by any means, but what I see in the literature is that in China, 30% of companies are associated in some way with the state. You know, in the United States, of course, it's very different from that. You know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac are two examples of governmental enterprises um, and state involvement in uh, tech in the States, I think has been pretty extensive in certain industries. But, you know, it, from a cultural perspective, there's much less of that in the United States, actually, right? So why not let states in this area sign on in a bilateral or a multilateral way to rules that make sense for them given their own, their own economies? So, you know, I think um, that we see the development of special rules. Um, we also see, uh, um, you, you know, the due diligence principle, which a number of people have mentioned, this idea of the duty to prevent uh, as well, too, as being part of attribution. Uh, we see the Security Council weighing in in specific ways, you know, on terrorism and coming up with specific rules. And certainly Crawford at the time said that, you know, the, the articles on attribution are deliberately vague because we want to allow tribunals, we want to allow states to develop rules that that work in specific instances. So I don't have any problem with um, the development of all these, um, you know, out all these alternative ways of looking at it. But again, I think the end point here actually is one of unified responsibility and ideally a treaty because we want to close the accountability gap because when there are wrongs, we want to give victims or uh, um, you know others who were affected by these wrongs um, a chance to uh, come at this and to get uh, remedies. And then that branches into the immunity question as well too. You know, we can prove responsibility, but then we have to figure out a venue that um, that people can go to as well too. And if immunities are too broad, even a, a well-developed responsibility regime will will prevent, I think, um, you know, access to justice in these circumstances. Great, thank you, Kristen. And I'll jump in here. Um, so, uh, so. Great. So I love this idea of uh, state and private on a continuum and the fact that this that our rules seem to be kind of arbitrarily setting the needle somewhere in this continuum. I think that there's, um, you know, as I said earlier, I think that that the rules are casting the state as a minimally responsible state. Um, and I think there's um, four different potential responses. And this partly picks up on what Kristen was saying, too. Um, so the first response is um, don't worry about it. And fill the gap with primary rules, right? Like the due diligence principle or whatever else. Um, second, um, try to move the needle on the attribution rules to set the, the, the needle in this continuum somewhere else, right? Um, third, um, focus on, on special rules and perhaps um, grow the state's responsibility in particular areas with something like a strict liability regime. Um, four, uh, focus on the responsibility of private actors, right? So we don't create a governance gap through um, shunting entities out of this public realm and into the private. So the first of these, um, focusing on um, the, the primary rules like due diligence is rather straightforward. It's probably where we're going, um, but it means that the attribution rules will continue to be heavily invoked in some areas like investment and somewhat ignored in others. Um, the next two are, are much more politically ambitious and less feasible. I think um, in terms of updating the attribution rules, I do think it'd be possible for the, them to say quite a lot more about what should be within the government's responsibility, right? Um, they could be less agnostic about what is a governmental function. And I have to commend to you a great article by Fred McGray um, this past uh, summer in AGIL and this response symposium that I had the pleasure of uh, editing in AGIL Unbound a month or two ago, which really um, tries to tease out what might be a governmental function under international law. Um, but the, the articles seem to have a view that some things are inherently go uh, governmental, and Alex does great work on this, um, but the ambiguity hasn't really been fleshed out in practice. Um, it would be possible to, uh, to, for them to say more. 
Um, the most aggressive suggestion, I think, is the one that we could um, create special rules in some areas to take a less or to create a less minimally responsible state, right? Adopt something like a strict liability rule where the state becomes responsible for everything in particular areas. Um, and I know this seems uh, quite far out there, but it's not theoretically or conceptually necessary that you limit the state's responsibility to actors over which there's some sort of agency relationship. Um, in space law, in Article uh, 6, the Outer Space Treaty, um, state parties to the treaty bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space, whether these activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities. So in outer space, states cannot avoid responsibility for outsourcing uh, by outsourcing their space program to private actors, for instance, responsible for whatever any of their nationals do, um, whether the state ordered it, whether the function is governmental or not. Um, so this is an attribution rule, but in substance, it seems much closer to the primary rule of due diligence, right? And the point is that the attribution rules are not um, necessarily where they are now, and they're not immutable, they can change. We can theoretically by treaty or customary um, evolution um, decide that states can be responsible for a whole range of activities carried out by their nationals or within their territories. Um, and this might be worth exploring in, uh, in areas where a broader conception of responsibility would be useful. And very briefly, um, oh, I, I really should cede uh, the floor. Okay, so just in, in uh, just a couple words, um, the fourth response would be to make the international responsibility regime more robust um, for private actors. So we'd have to worry less about the public-private divide. Um, and you know, it, it, there's also nothing necessary about our current um, uh, our current. Uh, um, organization where corporations fall on the private side of that divide. And I, Shimen, you plugged my book, so I'll plug it too. I'm editing a volume that should be coming out hopefully next year or thereabouts about on these general topics. And Doreen Lustig has written a fantastic chapter for that book where she points out that we've, we've developed this separate spheres presumption where corporations are private and untouchable by international law and states are public, but that's actually a relatively recent contrivance um, that arose towards the end of the 19th century as the colonial chartered companies were winding down. So we don't have to stay there. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Alex. Uh, thank you. Um, and I think a lot of the, um, uh, a, a, you know, a lot of really great points have already been made. So I'll try not to kind of repeat too much. Um, I think this, this question about the future of the articles is really challenging. And it's partly because it's not entirely clear what kind of job we want the articles to do or, or what kind of job we ought to want them to do. Um, if the purpose of the articles is, is supposed to be to provide very clear answers to attribution problems, then I suppose the answer is that they don't always do a very good job of that at the moment. Um, they don't provide a very clear and detailed account of how to draw the boundary between you know, um, governmental and non-governmental acts. Um, although they do give us a kind of concept, conceptual framework, we can imagine ways in which the rules might be more detailed. So one possible outcome for the future is that that's what happens, right? That uh, the more practice we get, the more clarity that arises over how the boundary is drawn between state and non-state conduct. So the framework of the rules is kind of filled in with more detail over time. Now, one of the problems with this, of course, it, it would raise concerns of its own, whether clearer rules end up being actually more open to manipulation um, or whether rules developed uh, in one context ends up, end up being relied on in other contexts, leading to um, sort of undesirable uh, outcomes or transplantations of the rules. So the second possibility is that we end up seeing um, the rules become clearer, but only in particular contexts or in different ways in different contexts. Um, and this could include either the development of kind of special practice in different fields or special treaty codification, the kind of practice that Kristen was talking about before. Um, uh, so maybe our conclusion is that, you know, if at the general level of international law, all you can do is a framework. And if we want more clarity, we have to get more specialized. Um, and of course, that comes with the risk that what we perceive of as these general rules of state responsibility might fragment into sectoral approaches. Whether or not that's a good thing is another really hard question. 
Um, it might create greater certainty in particular fields, but then you're going to get more uncertainty over boundary questions between fields, more incentives for um, we might think of as forum shopping, you know, framing your claim in a certain way to take advantage of different attribution rules um, that, that might exist in uh, different contexts. So a third possibility is that we're not going to see greater clarity at all, that the rules of responsibility uh, might continue to change themselves in line with changes in states, the way they, they organize their domestic affairs. Um, the rules might even get less clear, actually, um, if we follow the approach of some investment tribunals, which sort of take the articles on state responsibility as a kind of launching pad for a kind of more holistic exercise that looks at all of these elements in the round and then makes a kind of overall judgment um, about attribution. Um, now, while uncertainty in general might be a bad thing, um, I guess I'd just sort of say that this wouldn't be entirely without merit either, because it would enable the rules on state responsibility to kind of track and respond to changes in the world. So if the articles had been codified in, in a lot of detail, you know, in the 1950s or the 1970s, um, I doubt we'd be very satisfied with their outcome now. Um, so, you know, in some ways, maybe the best gift we can give the international lawyers of the future is to leave them the space to adapt the rules to the problems of their time, right? Um, a fourth possibility, um, which has already been talked about uh, quite a lot, is that the articles become less central, uh, either because other forms of responsibility become more important, and um, whether those are domestic or private or shared or collective, um, or because the shrinking state becomes a less important actor, and so we're less focused on state responsibility, um, or because the state becomes a more important actor, but with a focus not on the state as an actor themselves, but the state as a regulator, and the state responsibility is increasingly based not on the question of attribution of parastatal entities, but on the direct responsibility of the state for failing to prevent wrongs or failing to remedy their effects. Um, so what does the future hold? And um, yeah, it's uh, possibly some combination of all of these that, um, you know, that, that the articles get, clar get greater clarity in certain respects, um, but that also there's scope, I think, for um, divergence around how significant the role of the article articles is in certain fields, whether um, either specialist rules might be developed or, or whether other forms of, um, uh, of responsibility um, develop in response to the, the kind of limitations of the articles, whether that's a limitation in their scope or a limitation in how much clarity they actually bring um, to the questions they're addressing. Thanks very much, Alex. So we have just a few minutes left for questions. So please do feel free to use the um, Q&A uh, feature um, at the bottom of your screen. And I'm also going to, um, I believe I'm gonna share my screen here. Can you see the um, slide about CLE credit? Shimen, yes? Yes, okay. So um, so this is this panel is, is certified for CLE credit. Um, so the code is 503-513 um, to, to obtain CLE credit. You have to uh, write down the code and enter it in the CLE affirmation form. Um, and I'm supposed to affirm that you will not be able to receive CLE credit without the code and the code will not be provided after the panel. So here it is, 503-513. Okay, with that, back to our scheduled programming. Um, if I can figure out how to unshare my screen. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so we have a couple questions here in, in, the, um, in the chat. So um, do I have a volunteer to take on um, Arnold Pronto's great questions here about um, whether the tweaking in the future, the scope of the attribution rules might require some sort of fundamental changes in other provisions in the articles like circumstances precluding wrongfulness, invocation of responsibility, reparation, countermeasures. Kristen, do you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, I'd like to say hello to my friend Arnold, who could answer this question I, I, himself, I think, because he is a specialist um, on these articles. But I'll just uh, give my two cents on this. I mean, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Arnold, that everything is interconnected. And I guess I would say that it operates at two levels. There's the political level, you know, that if a treaty were to be negotiated, then I think that it would, you know, kind of prompt states to um, weigh in and think about how they might, you know, tweak all sorts of, of, of aspects. But, you know, on the substantive level, 
um, issue of how do the attribution articles relate to other aspects of the treaty. I think you're absolutely right. You know that um, the invocation of responsibility, for example, sort of presupposes a state function, right? That states are the primary actors here. And so if you were to change the responsibility uh, or attribution rules, for example, and have um, you know more coverage of state-affiliated entities, then all of a sudden that might um, expand you know which entities would actually be able to um, to uh, um, uh, you know raise a, a case under the articles. Um, similarly, I think we might have uh, situations where the already um, controversial countermeasures measures provisions would raise all sorts of other actions or questions about what would be included in the scope of them. So. Um, it's it's not you know uh, a light issue, and perhaps that's a, a reason for saying that it is better to have specialized rules. I mean, these have worked very well, uh, and um, I, I totally take on board your point that you know a lot of the ideas behind these when the articles were being developed were to you know create rules that would grow with time, that would um, accommodate changes. I think what the panelists have been pointing out today is that there were just certain things that. Um, even the very prescient members of the International Law Commission, you know, did not foresee like the prominence of the internet um, right now, you know, or the, you know, the, the massive um, um, rise in, in state-owned entities in certain areas of the economy and in, in certain states. So, um, so that's, that's my two cents on it. But, uh, um, but I think that there's a lot to say about this. And I think Arnold raises a, a really important point about, you know, we can't tinker with these rules um, without sort of realizing that there's a whole cascade effect um, in the articles themselves. Thank you. And why don't I suggest that, that Shemen, would you like to um, comment on um, the question about the significance of the Business and right, Human Rights Treaty um, in the space, since you were also talking about human rights? <laughs> I, would, I would love to uh, tackle Julia's question, but maybe we can. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, okay, that's great. Why don't you go there? Uh, because, you know, to, to the question about business and human rights treaty, I mean, certainly any. Um, any spaces in which concepts of international responsibility are being elaborated and attached to different kinds of actors uh, is, is a space that, that will also not remain self-contained, right? And, and that can also cross-fertilize um, other, other areas. So to the extent that that conversation is, is being focused uh, in, in treaty you know, conversations, I think it, it's a great way to kind of channel uh, additional thought in this area. Um, but, but to Julia's point, and maybe an example of, of cross-fertilization is precisely, yes, my, my conception or my invocation of shared responsibility um, is very much, uh, in the first instance, uh, an idea of, of the non-mutually exclusive nature of the responsibility of the state itself and its officials. Um, so, so certainly that uh, move does not yet reach private actors. Um, but, but again, the, the notion, which, which to my mind seems self-evident, but again, was not sort of the prevailing understanding uh, for a long time, is, is that a state's responsibility is, is, again, not to the exclusion of the responsibility of other actors, and in particular, the responsibility under international not, law and not necessarily just uh, domestic law. So, um, you know, in the interest of time, I guess the, the 30 seconds I'll add, uh, because I you know, certainly want to get others in and I see there's more questions coming up, so that's great. Uh, is when you when you say Leviathan, I, I can't help but think of you know Kristen mentioned the internet. Um, I've got the Golden Gate Bridge behind me, but I'm actually standing half a mile from Facebook right now, and uh, you know I think we, we do need to think about you know which if we, if we do have the the thin state or the, the skinny state, uh, it, it's not because. Um, the world has become, you know, any less interconnected. To the contrary, it's more interconnected, but through very different channels. And so, uh, so certainly, you know, I'm not even sure that a government has that many governments in the world have the capacity at the moment uh, to exercise real regulatory, uh, you know, whether it's due diligence obligations with respect to some of these huge companies. Again, we need to tread carefully because. Uh, I don't, you don't need me to tell you that uh, heavy handed government regulation in some places would be to the detriment uh, of, of people who are uh, using these services, but, but the need for radical reconceptualization uh, may be building on, not necessarily uh, undoing the work of, of the draft articles uh, is certainly quite evident. Great. 
Um, Alex, would you like to weigh in on, on either of these, on, on the possibility of shared responsibility um, as a framework to capture more of the private or um, Maybe other just frameworks more on like the, um, human rights? Just a little bit more on the kind of um, business and human rights treaty, because I, I think that's a, it, it's a really um, interesting and important question. It, it does kind of highlight a, um, a, a big accountability gap problem um, in, in the, the way that the world has changed and the way that the kind of transfer of power to the private sector hasn't come with, you know, the development of forms of responsibility. Um, and um, uh, and um, as Shemaine said, you know, um, there, there are relatively few states who, who are in a position um, to, to you know, be able to regulate um, some of the, the, the largest multinational actors. Um, but they're playing um, a more and more kind of fundamentally important role um, in, in people's lives and um, in, in the functioning of democracies, if nothing else. Um, now, if we think of a kind of business and human rights treaty, it's, a, it's an effort to kind of get into that space mediated through the state again, and it's relying on kind of, again, different forms of accountability, right? Because you're, you're looking to hold states accountable for their treaty responsibilities. You're asking states to hold private parties responsible for um, their responsibilities that are kind of set out as well. Um, but then there's also a kind of sense of public accountability as well around some of the initiatives there around kind of transparency and reporting and due diligence and, and that's another kind of form of accountability as well, which, which doesn't depend on, you know, so much on legal mechanisms, but on, on kind of other ways in which we can hold actors responsible. And that's, I guess we're running out of time, so I probably uh, should leave it there. Uh, sure, last remark, Kristen. Thank you. I, there were two really interesting questions in the chat just about, you know, would we look at NGOs or philanthropies or would we think of lobbying as being government activities? And I think in both of those situations, we would say no under Article 5, because the Article 5 test really requires direction or control. And at least the more recent jurisprudence in the um, in the investor state context looks at authorization. But there does have to be a link with the state. And so I think that these situations, even if you have um, NGOs or corporations that are sort of moving into the public space, um, that's outside of a state's control or direction or authorization. So we would say no in those circumstances. Thanks very much. And I'm told that we must uh, end this panel now, but I wanna extend a thank you to all of my co-panelists here for a really interesting conversation. And thank you to everyone um, sitting in for um, spending time with us uh, today and enjoy uh, the rest of your day at International Law Weekend. All right, thank you. <laughs>